So hi everyone, welcome to our program today. Welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, Meet Bats and Other Mammals in Your Neighbor with Natural History Museum. My name is Anne, I'm a librarian with LA County Library and I'll be your host today. I will be turning off my camera as we have our presenters present, but I will be checking your questions throughout the program on the chat on the right hand side. So please feel free throughout the chat um, throughout the program, type in your questions on the chat and I'll definitely look through them and ask them so the presenters can actually answer your questions. Um, do you remember to please um, post the questions to all panelists so then we can all see your question. And um, of course, uh, if you feel like there's something you need to ask right away, just ask and that's okay. Um, just type it in the chat and we'll read through them. Um, but uh, with, I do want to mention we are able to have this special program today because this program is sponsored by Edison International and LA County Library Foundation. And this is in partnership with Natural History Museum and we have very, two very special guests with us today. Our first guest is Dr. Casey Bell and she's going to talk to us about what she's been researching and what she's going to be doing. And then later on, we're going to have Mr. Miguel. And I'm going to try to say this correctly. I said it right one time, but I might not say it correctly again. Uh, or Ordinana. Um, and he's going to be speaking with us later. But um, first, I'm going to have Dr. Bell come and speak with us. Are you ready? Thank you, Anne, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Anne said, I am Casey Bell, and I am the Curator of Terrestrial Mammals at the Natural History Museum of LA County. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background and my research, as well as the mammals of LA, and a little bit about Los Angeles and climate change, and then mostly Earth. I'll end with some information about the museums and collections and why museums and our resources here are important. So my research program uses museum specimens to study where different mammal species live, how distri their distributions change in different parasite communities. And I have done this um, starting when I was an undergraduate student studying the distributions of different small mammals in Canada and Alaska. I did it for my master's research, studying the distributions and evolutionary histories of California, of two species of ground squirrels in California, the Mojave ground squirrel and the round-tailed ground squirrel. And then for my dissertation research, I studied chipmunks and their parasites. I'll talk a little bit more about some of that today. So to start, my um, career has given me the opportunity to do a lot of field work. So I've gotten to travel and do a lot of work in some really exciting places. The majority of the fieldwork for my research has been conducted in Western North America, actually the Western United States, but a little bit in Canada and quite a bit of time in Alaska. But I've also gotten to do fieldwork in Central and South America. And those were kind of just um, trips where I was going along to help do research and help collect animals and less for my specific research. I've also had the pleasure of getting to go to Mongolia twice. So I've had two trips going to Mongolia to do specimen based research on parasites. So I'm gonna start with my research program and then work my way down. So for my research, like I said, I study small mammals and their parasites. And I'm just gonna give you a really scaled out um, explanation of what that means. So part of the, my research is studying how species get where they are today and how we have the species come to exist that we see today. So one way to do this would be to imagine that this black outline here is one species of chipmunk and through time, different events happen that lead to the divergence or the evolution of two different species of chipmunks. So in the past, there was a black chipmunk, and now we have an orange chipmunk and a green chipmunk. And I'm curious, my research looks at the processes that lead to that, and it's things like um, ice ages or you know being restricted to different parts of their habitat can lead to those changes. And I'm also interested in their parasites and what happened when the species evolved. So, for example, when the black chipmunk um, evolved into the orange chipmunk and the green chipmunk, it's possible that their parasites stayed the same. And so that now all three species of chipmunks would have the same species of parasite. But it's also possible that those parasites changed alongside their hosts. And this is important because um, when parasites evolve with their hosts, 
it impacts their ability to actually go onto different species. So we can't get a parasite from a chipmunk for the most part, there are a few exceptions, but mostly we can't get parasites from chipmunks. So the evolutionary history is important because it, it ends up impacting who those parasites can infect. There's also things called host switching. So for example, there could be an instance where this purple outline squirrel had a parasite that was then able to transfer to this green chipmunk, and that was what we call a host switch. So again, these kinds of things are important for understanding how easily parasites can move around among different species. Another thing that I study is distributions of species and how different things impact those. So for example, pretend we have this population of mice that are these orange mice living on the landscape, and then we build a city like Los Angeles. What happens to the mice that were living in Los Angeles? Do they get pushed out to the edge or are they able to keep living in the same environment? There's lots of um, opportunities to investigate these types of questions with the species we have in Los Angeles. We also have introduced species and they can impact the, the species that were living here beforehand. So it could be that when the house mouse came and was brought into Los Angeles, it actually impacted the deer mice that had already been living there. And that's another part of my research that I'm looking to investigate. So again, using those examples of the deer mouse and the house mouse, the deer mouse was living here before um, Europeans came to Western North America. And the house mouse, which is the picture that's on the right, that was actually brought along on ships with humans um, and people who came European colonizers. If we look at the distributions of these species through time, before 1950, we can see where the deer mice was found on this map. So you can see there's lots of these points. This is using museum records. So this is how museums inform us about how things change through time. Pre-1950, we know that deer mice were living in all of these areas with these little orange dart dots. Then if we look after 1990, you can see that we don't have records in the same places. And it's possible that the species is no longer living there, but it's also possible that they're living there, but nobody has detected them. Another example then is to look at the house mouse, as I mentioned, it wasn't here before European colonizers came. And so we can see that there's this area um, pre-1950, or pre we can see where it was found in the LA area. And then we can see that it's expanded more. So some examples, it looks like it's moved um, south and east a little bit. But again, it could be that it was in other areas and it wasn't detected. So that's one of the parts of research that I want to do is look and see if we can tell how these species distributions have changed through time, and if we can detect what is causing those distributions to change. So are deer mice moving because people are there or are deer mice moving because house mice are there or is there something else that's potentially impacting where they can live? In addition to where the species can live, I'm also interested in studying their parasites. What I would really like to know is are this, the deer mice that were here before sharing parasites with that introduced house mice and vice versa or are these parasites so host specific that they're not actually able to move among the different species? So this is a new research program that I'm just getting started here in Los Angeles. Um, now a little bit more about the mammals of Los Angeles. So in LA County, there's actually 85 species of terrestrial mammals, and that means the mammals that live on land. So I'm not counting the, the sea mammals like the sea lions and the dolphins and whales. Um, just kind of a broad overview, there's the Virginia opossum and some others, that's a marsupial, and that was an introduced species. Then there are rodents, things like mice, voles, rats, squirrels, and gophers. There are carnivores like skunks, raccoons, coyotes, foxes, and mountain lions and bears, among others. We also have a few species of rabbits, and then there's shrews and moles and bats. And Miguel is going to tell you a little bit more about carnivores and bats when he talks. So just kind of um, a broad overview of who some of these mammals are. Um, again, we have up there on the left that deer mouse, like I mentioned before. Uh, we also have something like the kangaroo. Uh, this is Merriam's kangaroo rat. These, the deer mouse and Merriam's kangaroo rat are by far the most common um, species native to Los Angeles. So they've been here um, for a long time before European colonizers came and they are abundant. Um, even in areas where people live, as long as the habitat is available to them, there are, they exist in really high numbers. Then we have other species like the gray squirrel, the Western gray squirrel, which used to be found uh, throughout different parts of Los Angeles. 
And now it's restricted to the mountains and Griffith Park. Um, largely, it's not found in the other parks or parts of Los Angeles. And that's probably due to a few things, one of them being habitat loss, and then the other one being the introduction of other species of squirrels. Down here on the right, this is one of my favorite um, my favorite um, members of the Los Angeles road community, and this is Bada's pocket gopher. So if you've seen these kind of strange looking fresh pushed up mounds of dirt uh, around anywhere, basically you can see them in the city or out on hiking trails. I see them in parks. You can see them in the like medians between roads sometimes. That's uh, these little gophers down here on the right. So this is the type of road that lives underground and they push up the dirt when they're cleaning out their burrows and they're called pocket gophers because they have these really cool cheek pouch pockets that they use to carry food move dirt and things like that around um, then we have these other species of mammals that were introduced so as i mentioned the virginia opossum has actually been introduced to the area this is the eastern fox squirrel this is a squirrel that you most commonly see in los angeles in like parks or forested areas in lower elevations once you get up into the less developed forests and in the mountains, you will see the gray squirrel again and not the fox squirrel. Then we have the house mouse, which isn't extremely common, but they are around. The probably most common rodents that we have around here are the rats. So we have here the black rat and, um, or it's sometimes called the roof rat. I've also heard it called the fruit rat. And then there's also another species of rat that's called the brown rat um, or sometimes called the Norway rat. We have carnivores. Like I said, Miguel is going to talk about some urban carnivores. So I thought I'd point out some of the ones that you don't see around the city quite as often. There's things like the spotted skunk in addition to the striped skunk that you may have seen. Uh, they're a little bit more rare and elusive. We also have things like the ringtail, which sometimes is called the ringtail cat, but it's not a cat. It's actually related to raccoon and the gray fox. And uh, we have rabbits. So there's a, the desert cottontail, which is the rabbit that you most commonly see around the city, as well as the brush rabbit. And it's actually very difficult to distinguish these two species from one another. And I actually suspect that this picture that I found on Wikipedia may not be a brush rabbit, but it could be. They're very difficult to tell apart. And then over here on the right is a picture of the black-tailed jackrabbit. It has a very distinguished uh, large ears sticking up. And then lastly, we have the shrews and moles in Los Angeles. This here, there are several species of shrews that can be found around Los Angeles. This is a picture of an ornate shrew. And um, although this is somebody holding it, I don't recommend holding any wild animals. Please don't handle them. I'm hoping that this was done um, with the proper permits and training. And then the one on the bottom right here is a broad-footed mole. And that's the mole that you'll, the only mole that you'll find around Los Angeles. I'm going to just quickly talk about climate change and um, how it's impacting us in Los Angeles because it comes back to being relevant to both museums and the mammals that live here. So we know that it's getting warmer, which means that we're getting less snow and the snow melts earlier. Also means we have more summer drought, like the one that we're experiencing now. And as you've noticed over the last few years, likely that we have increased wildfire. There um, are more wildfires, they're more intense and they're covering more ground. And this is going to impact all of the plant and animal species that live in Los Angeles. It means that there's going to be earlier spring events, um, which is phenology, which actually is the timing of things like flowering or reproduction or migration. And right now, things have evolved for those things to be synchronized so that flowers are going to bloom when there's going to be a pollinator available to pollinate them. And changes in phenology can actually lead to mismatches in that. There's also going to be problems with things like water flow and the timing of water flow that can impact those things. We also know that it's impacting where animals live. So um, research has shown that different species are actually migrating at different times and they're also changing their distributions to cooler areas. So we know, for example, that mammals are not only going north, they're also going up in elevation. And this has been correlated with changes in temperatures. Just a quick pitch for things that you can do to help us study this. You can actually record observations for the wildlife that you see on iNaturalist, and that will help us understand how these species distributions are changing through time and track where different species are being found. 
And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the museum. So I've told you about my research. I've told you about how, uh, what species live in Los Angeles, how things may be changing, and also why it matters for climate change to understand that. So museums are a key part of understanding these things. The natural history collection that we have here, as I said, I'm in charge of the terrestrial mammals. We have about 1,700 species of mammals in our collection. We have about 98,000 specimens, so about 98,000 different species or different individuals with data. And most of those are terrestrial mammals. And we have several of them that are skin specimens. I'm going to try to show you here in a very non um, obnoxious way what a skin specimen is. So this here is a a museum specimen of a kangaroo rat. And what this is, is this is just the dried out skin. It's got cotton stuffed in the eye and wires in the tail to help hold it stiff. And so this record is really important because it has a tag on it. And this tag tells us where this animal was found and when it was collected. And it also usually includes the measurements because this body size will change after you make a specimen. All of these are important pieces of data that help us understand how animals live where they do and how that changes through time. This specimen here is the bodice pocket gopher that I talked about. It's not the prettiest made skin. They tend to be more uniform in size, but just so you can see that um, we have these types of animals that help us understand why, where animals live and how that changes through time. And by putting these specimens in the collection, we have a permanent record that we can revisit over and over again. And in fact, I have used these museum specimens to study the parasites from animals that were collected in the early 1900s. So it's, you can't anticipate the uses for these specimens and you can never go back in time and collect them. So if somebody said, was there a chipmunk living in Los Angeles in 1910? I would have no way to prove that if there wasn't a specimen to document it. So it's important that we continue to collect these specimens and use these specimens as records to um, study biodiversity and how it's changing through time. Our museum has mostly specimens from California uh, with a large number of them from Los Angeles County. And the, um, we have specimens from about 115 different countries. Just so we have some really interesting specimens that were collected from the Channel Islands during the Channel Island Biological Survey in the mid, early to mid 1900s. We also have specimens from Africa. So uh, back when museum scientists would do things like go collect specimens specifically for dioramas. So when they went to get these black rhinos, they also collected other specimens from Africa. They also collected parasites. So these are actually bot fly larvae that came out of the stomach of this rhinoceros here on the right. And these are some of the other species that were collected at the time. So we have a lot of information about them. And then I'm going to just quickly show you a little video about um, our warehouse. So I've been mostly talking about the species, the specimens that we have here in the museum, in the main natural history museum. We also have a warehouse where we store the large specimens. So um, I apologize, it's a little bit jumpy, but here's a video of that. So it's a large warehouse space where we have things like whales and elephants. And you can see this is a large skull of a beaked whale that we have out there. And since these specimens have special requirements for storage, primarily space, because we don't save the skins for them, so they're not subject to pests, we store these out at this warehouse um, where we can access them as needed, and we have the space to work with them and store them. These here are actually elephant skulls. So you can see the large holes for their tusks. And you can also see these really unique teeth that whales have. Um, and this big hole up here in the top, which is actually the reason that um, elephant skulls originally when they were found, it's thought that that's where the idea of Cyclops came from is that they saw those large holes and thought that they were Cyclops eyes. And then I'm gonna jump over to some other things. There's some, uh, that's a hippo. So that's a big male hippo with those really cool tusks. We have a few other African species here. Some of these came directly from Africa. Some of them came from zoos. So there's some hippo, some more hippos. We have things like the giraffes down here. And then we also have some rhinoceroses. So we have some rhinos. You can see they don't have the, Horns attach them because the horns are actually attached to the skin and not part of the bone. And then the last 
big thing that we store out here at this warehouse are the whales. So there's some very large whale jaw bones you can see here. And they're so large, they're actually somewhat difficult to store. Um, so they're stored, can be stored upright on these racks. That one that's very dark in the back, that's just the natural oil seeping out of the bones. So um, there's a big whale. These are all baleen whales that you can see here. So you, they no longer have baleen. Whales don't have teeth. They have these big sheets of keratin, which form baleen, and that's how they filter feed. Um, there's going to be just a moment, a skull of a blue whale, and then that'll be the end of the whale section. And that will be all I have to say about um, the collections today until you ask me some more wonderful questions. Oh, you can see that jaw back there in the left. Um, that's a sperm whale jaw. It's a very narrow toothed jaw. So those whales don't have baleen, they have teeth. And then this big one right here at the end, that is a blue whale skull. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I think I can take some questions. Yes, we do have someone who asked uh, if you were going to talk about uh, the variants of um, the animals in California specifically, like how they had the slight variants in them uh, compared to the US native ones. I'm not really sure what that means. Oh, well, I guess they, was, they just wanted to know if you were going to go into a discussion of how oh. the animals had changed throughout time. Yeah, no. So when I talk, we talk about change through time, there's a, that can mean a lot of different things. And usually the type of change that I study is actually change in the DNA that has led to differences in um, what we call a species or a population and how they can interbreed. And so it's variable across the landscape. There are some species that are only found in California, so they're very unique to California, but there's other species like the deer mouse, which is common across all of North America. And someone also asked if um, the squirrels, um, did they, are the squirrels the animal that has plague or is it other animals? Yes and yes. So squirrels do carry plague. Um, and they get it transmitted via fleas, um, and it, but it's not just squirrels. Um, a lot of different species of rodents and carnivores can transmit it. Um, and it, it's not usually, usually not directly transmitted from the animal itself. It's usually transmitted through the um, fleas that they have. In most parts of the US, it's primarily associated with prairie dogs. So usually we don't worry too much about plague outside of prairie dog colonies, but it is possible for it to be transmitted by fleas on other animals and mostly it's associated with squirrels. But it can also be transmitted by the fleas of rats, which is what the, the Black Death, the Great Plagues of Europe are associated with. And then someone asked the arroyo below JPL are the in jeopardy species now in extinct? Unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. I am fairly new to Los Angeles and I am not familiar with the Arroyo below GAPL. So I am sorry about that, but I will look into it. <laughs> it sounds interesting. And someone was asking, do chipmunks, um, do we actually have chipmunks in California? Yes, so in California, there are, California is blessed with 13 species of chipmunks. So we are very fortunate to have more chipmunks than any other state in the US. And right here in Los Angeles County, we have three species of chipmunks. Excuse me, sorry, two species of chipmunks, Merriam's chipmunk and the lodgepole chipmunk. But once you go farther north, they're just, we get more and more species of chipmunks, so. And then someone was also asking, um, with the current drought, uh, does that impact uh, the animals or species in any way? It probably does. We don't know a lot about it right now. Um, it takes, we have to kind of, there's usually a lag time for us to see the impacts, but it is likely impacting species in, a, in multiple ways. Um, oftentimes there are things just like um, that are trickle down effects. So without moisture, plants may not flower. So, you know, you hear about the spring blooms in the Mojave Desert. Well, a lot of um, species rely on those plants to reproduce. And if you have multiple years in a row where they don't get the annual bloom, then that species isn't actually going to reproduce and that's going to lead to population declines. 
Okay. Well, and then someone was also asking, are there any species that you study in that you are studying right now are endangered? So not that I am currently studying, none of the species I'm currently studying are endangered. There is a species of chipmunk that has been considered for um, being listed as threatened in Nevada, but my research has actually shown that that's not a unique species. So it's on an isolated mountaintop in Nevada, but it's actually, it's called Palmer's chipmunk, but it is actually the same chipmunk as the Uinta chipmunk. So while we should probably conserve the chipmunks on those mountains, it's not something that means the species will go extinct if the pots chipmunks no longer exist on that mountain. Um, and then I also have studied um, the Mojave ground squirrel, which is a state listed threatened species. And it is one of the species that's impacted by things like um, continual years of drought because they don't reproduce in years that there are not good annual blooms. Mm. And then someone asked, I don't know if it would be something that you would be aware of, um, but um, do you know the official um, LA County policy in regards to coyotes? I do not know what it is. There is a chance, I don't want to speak for him, there's a potential chance that Miguel will know because he is much more familiar with urban carnivores and policies regarding them. So he may know, but I don't know for sure. I think that's all the questions I have for now. Um, I don't see anyone else asking questions at the moment. So um, I think if Miguel is ready, maybe I'll transfer the present presenter um, privileges to you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, primarily bats and carnivores that live here in the Los Angeles area um, and how they're basically uh, able to survive here in Los Angeles with us. Uh, but to give you some background, uh, who I am, I'm a wildlife biologist, which means that I go out into the field and study animals where they live and kind of learn about their habitat requirements. And habitat is um, basically where an animal can find food, water, and shelter that it needs to survive. And so for some animals, um, it's something as simple as under a dumpster or your apartment complex. And some for others, it needs to be in, in deep canyons with native oak woodland habitat. And so that's what I'm going to be, be able to talk about today is kind of how these animals, even within the carnivore, species or the bat species kind of differ in what they need to survive here in LA. But I grew up here in LA. I just want to share that because I have that local connection that I'm very proud of. Grew up really close to Griffith Park. My mom um, really fed my passion for wildlife or animals by taking me to places she knew animals existed like the zoo or the Natural History Museum. Um, but um, even with all that support, um, my mom didn't know anything about nature or science and and so when I would see these animals, I would think that, oh, I guess all the cool nature exists in Africa because what I'm learning in the zoos and, and the museums is that all the animals that are important and that need conservation help are, are pretty far away. So this, this seemed like a pretty difficult career for me to get into, but thankfully I had these accidental encounters with wildlife while going outside um, and, out of my apartment complex would run into a coyote on our way to the car and always would spark my curiosity of how these animals that I would see in, in books or on TV in these really wild places like Yellowstone, how are they surviving in the middle of the city? Um, what do they need to survive? So that, that kept me, me curious and connected to nature, even though it was, it was accidental. Um, fast forward, um, I started that, that passion for coyotes, those, those random interactions with coyotes, even one that included coyotes killing my very first pet, uh, my cat, Whiskey. Um, I still, it still led to my curiosity in, in wildlife research and, and studying more about animals that really related to me, relate, relatable to me that lived here in the city that I grew up in. Um, but unfortunately, I had to go all the way to, to graduate school and, and go through a lot of uh, training and, and meet some scientists to learn that we had animals called bobcats here in Los Angeles. Um, but fortunately, one of these opportunities led to a job to really immerse myself in, into that research. And I learned about a technology called camera trap. So in my video screen, you can see this device here. It's a motion activated camera 
that is triggered by motion or um, or in, in, or body heat and triggers a take a video or a photo. And we can learn about how many individuals live in a certain area, if they have identifiable pelt markings like bobcats, excuse me, or we can also just learn about what species are able to survive in certain cities. So bobcats are a really good example. In comparison to coyotes, for instance, that I just showed you earlier, bobcats only eat meat. So even though they, you can see them in this urban setting, they have to have meat or native prey to be around uh, or natural prey like rats, rabbits, mice, um, to be in that neighborhood for them to be able to survive and, and have reproduce and all that kind of stuff. Coyotes on their hand, um, yes, they'll eat rabbits and rats and, and probably prefer that, but they'll also eat fallen fruit, um, garbage, um, your outdoor cat, um, if, if they need to, uh, to survive. So that's the difference is even though both coyotes and, and bobcats are carnivores, coyotes um, eat a lot of different things, are a little bit more bold, can live in packs, social packs, um, also can hunt alone. But bobcats are solitary unless they have kittens or, or about finding a mate. Um, and but mostly, yeah, solitary and and only eat meat. So it makes them a little more sensitive to certain situations and environments. And this type of work took me to to Nicaragua, where my family's from, and I was able to use these the same technology to study jaguars. Again, like the bobcat, have identifiable pelt markings, allow me to identify individuals and see how many are living in an area and how they're impacted by human development. And in this case, it was um, livestock ranching um, in this area. Um, so just an example of what I've, been, what I've been up to over the years. Um, but in Southern California, and this is where I wanted to be, where I wanted to do my research because it's such a really great place to do work because there's so many ecosystems in one place. We have mountains, we have deserts, we have wetlands, um, coastal areas, um, and a lot of animals are accommodated by that. And I wanted to bring up the opossum. I know Casey brought up that opossums are our only marsupial here in North America, but um, a lot of people confuse them for carnivores because they have those sharp teeth. They eat um, rabbits, lizards, meat, and, and, and um, plant matter, vegetation, uh, just like a, a raccoon would um, or a skunk would. And so they fill the same type of role in the ecosystem, but because they're related to different mammal species, um, they have pouch, they have embryonic young, they're not carnivores, they are officially marsupials. So I just wanna, and, but nonetheless, they're really cute. Here's one lounging in our nature gardens uh, right out here in the museum, which is, yeah, adorable during the day. Also nocturnal, like another carnivore that's very adaptable to the city, um, the raccoon um, that can live in sewers under your dumpster, um, eats like the coyote, a lot of different things, usually solitary, but can also tolerate one another, um, even though they get into squabbles here and there like these two are. And just like those opossums, they're making a home out of our garden here in South LA, just south of downtown, they're using our, lake, our pond and use their very sensitive hands to look for animals uh, under the water in pitch black darkness due to their sensitive hands um, can get crayfish and, and other things that, that they can find under the, under the water with their very sensitive hands, which is really cool. Um, bobcats, again, because they're small, they're able to survive, even though they have such sensitive uh, or specific requirements, making them more of a specialized species. Because they're so small, they're not as intimidating to us and they can take advantage of rabbits and rats, which are generally pretty abundant in most, most urban or at least suburban neighborhoods. But they have to contend with us, right? We're walking through their habitat with dogs, um, cycling through areas that they're trying to pass through safely. Um, and, but they do, their, do it when they can, like at night when we're asleep. So this deer is waiting for traffic to cross before it crosses that very same bridge those cyclists were on. Coyotes doing the same very early in the morning. Um, deer, a family of deer crossing from Griffith Park over to uh, the rest of the Santa Monica Mountains towards the Hollywood Bowl um, over the 101 freeway, not using this safer bridge that, that goes right over the 101. And also they use the LA River. I mean, a lot of, if you just saw this photo, a lot of people might think, oh my goodness, you studied coyotes in the Amazon? No, this is a rundo uh, in the middle of 
of the LA River and near near um, near uh, Atwater Village. And so, um, but if I didn't tell you that, who knows? Uh, nobody could probably figure that out. Um, this is a situation here in the LA River. These these coyotes, other animals, use it as a safer way to get from point A to point B, rather than trying to cross roads. They'll go through the middle of the river or even bike bike paths like this bobcat is on on the LA River bike bike path, going through it, almost approaching a tunnel there. Um, but I want to quickly share this story about a mountain lion that reached Griffith Park. So um, so this mountain lion here, his name is P22, which stands for 22nd Puma, um, studied by the National Park Service. This mountain lion crossed two major freeways to get into Griffith Park, um, which is basically why it made this mountain lion uh, legendary initially, but his legend has kind of increased um, over the years as he's gone into more adventures um, or misadventures probably from his perspective. Um, so he crossed two freeways, um, uh, uh, a journey no other mountain lion was able to make. To give you some reference, two other mountain lions tried to cross the 405, but didn't make it um, east. Um, why they're trying to cross um, these freeways? Because like the bobcat, they're solitary, don't like to be around each other, but because they're mountain lions and, and, and um, much more, many more times the size of a bobcat, they need more space to have the resources that they need. They follow a deer, that's their special, uh, their, their uh, prey of choice. And so the area needs to be big enough to support a population of deer. And there's not a lot of those, those types of contiguous open spaces left here in the Los Angeles area. So they're crossing freeways and also because they don't wanna be around each other, they have to find territories of their own and there's not a lot available. So they end up having to cross freeways sometimes like P22 had to do. This is the last barrier he had to cross actually before he reached Griffith Park. But he became famous because this famous photo from National Geographic was taken of him after 14 months of, of trying. And it really says, says a lot, right? That LA is not just a place for movie stars, um, beautiful people and smog. It's also a place where um, nature um, can coexist with people right in the middle of the city. Um, and more importantly that um, that even controversial species like mountain lions can also coexist. Even in a park that gets thousands of people a day, that's a fraction of the size of what a male mountain lion usually needs. It's nine square miles. Even though it's a big park, it's only nine square miles. And usually a male needs about 200 square miles to itself. So really amazing. Um, there is a recent photo, I, I, a more recent photo I had taken of him. Um, and um, another great example of how he's coexisting. So here he is um, in the middle of Griffith Park, here he, um, just hanging out in front of one of my camera traps by some water. Um, there he is, if you couldn't see him. And then less than 30 seconds later, a hiker runs, walks front. And um, a really great example of how he, mountain lions, even though um, they have the potential to be dangerous, don't want anything to do with us in most cases. And that's his secret to survival, just avoiding people. Um, and the secret to coexistence is us giving them their space that they, they need and deserve. Here's another great example of him kind of crossing through um, when people are asleep, when it's safer to go out. Sometimes he has to cross through someone's porch to get to where he needs to go in such an urbanized landscape. And, and before I get into this one, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. It's a mountain lion in Bel Air about to chase a deer across your screen so you don't miss it. Um, but this is a mountain lion that is the second to cross uh, the 405 East and only needs to cross the 101 to hit in Griffith Park, but he hasn't yet. So we'll see what happens. But enjoy this video of him chasing a deer in someone's Bel Air back. Comes a deer. There he goes. Really cool, right? Um, and um, then there, there's a campaign that make it easier for us to coexist and for these large wide ranging animals to survive by building these overpasses. Um, and also now I'm gonna switch over to a totally different <laughs> group of mammals, the bats. And, and maybe many of you were here to, to learn about bats. So when you Google bats, you think of bats and close your eyes. A lot of people think of this type of picture, an Indian flying fox, um, which is great. They're charismatic, great ambassador for bats. Um, but um, and also have a really important role in their ecosystem. They're fruit-eating bats. 
when they poop, they poop out, they they um, able to regenerate forests and help um, tropical fruits uh, and trees regenerate. Um, and more so in some cases than birds are willing to regenerate over clear cut areas. Um, so, uh, excuse me, fly over clear cut areas. And so they, they play an important role, but this is not the only bat out there. Um, they play a lot of different roles in our world the ecosystem, um, like the vampire bat um, sucks, drinks the blood um, of mammals and in some species drink the, the, the blood of birds um, using uh, anticoagulant in their saliva, which is actually very cute. They kind of lap it up like a cat drinks milk uh, once they start getting going, it's pretty cute. They also have the smallest bat in the world, so they range in size. So this is the bumblebee uh, bat which is um, just this type of horseshoe bat um, that is the size of your or tip of your finger almost. And we have the, the pollinating bats, which are the ones that drink nectar um, and from flowers, usually nocturnally flowering, flowering plants like agave plants and play a important role there. Um, and as they kind of brush up against those flowers, they transfer that pollen to other uh, nocturnal flowers and and do a really huge service that way. Um, 1,400 species of bats, which make up over 20% of all mammals or all species of mammals. Um, they save the agriculture industry billions of dollars. Three, that's a typo. It's way more than $3 billion, billion annually. Um, and um, because they act as natural pesticide, they save the agricultural, uh, the farmers from having to buy expensive pesticide and polluting our environment and harming our wildlife. Um, they don't have to use it. They don't have to use those funds. And so that's cost savings for us when that produce reaches the grocery store. The majority of all bats in the world eat insects. All bats in Los Angeles County eat insects only, and that's it. Uh, there's no fruit eating bats. There's no nectar feeding bats. In Orange County, we have fruit, uh, nectar feeding bats, but in LA, just insect eating bats. Um, and What's really cool, allows me to study them, instead of using camera trap technology, I use microphones. Um, but to do this in LA, um, we have to um, be very creative. In the LA River, for instance, I had to go over the Sunny Nook Bridge, which is a pedestrian bridge, and attachment to the bottom of it, which involved um, repelling over every single time. Um, but we got the data that we need to prove that bats use the LA River, and even um, riparian specialists, and riparian is like river habitat specialists were using the LA River and found it valuable. So that's really important to know. Um, the way we do it is we capture the sound, their echolocations, which is their ability to communicate using, um, communicate, hunt and navigate in darkness by sending out an echo in pitch black darkness and receiving that sound back after it bounces off of something and making a mental picture of what's in front of them. And each species of bat has a very unique call, like this particular species of Mexican free tail bat and this myotis species that has more of a hockey stick, stick shaped call, very different though. And that's kind of how it works. Like they send out this signal, comes back to them. They can figure out, oh, there's a moth in front of me. They can tell what direction it's going, how big it is, how fast it is, all that kind of stuff, just with sound alone, pretty amazing stuff. Um, this work has been, um, pretty pretty um, fun because it's involved a lot of um, trying out new things, trying out setting new places, using this advancement in technology to put these detectors in places nobody studied bats before. So my first stop was the LA Zoo. We got multiple species of bats, including the Western Mastiff bat, which is thought to be extirpated from the LA area for about 10 years. Extirpated means locally extinct from a certain area but it's here and we found it multiple times since then, which is great. Um, and then also, then when I moved to the, the nature gardens, even smaller space, only three and a half acres of space, but found really cool bats, including bats that are foliage specialists, which means that they only roost um, in trees or in bushes. They don't wanna roost in, in um, roofs or other structures. Um, they have specific requirements, but because we have this little tiny patch of green space, it really made the difference for them, which is really cool to see. Um, but how about going in deeper in the urban core? That's where community science comes in, which is my main role here at the museum, which is to do research on wildlife and local nature 
um, but involve the community in that process and do it in a way that engages the community in a genuine way where they're really um, interested in the project and what we're studying and what we're learning uh, about wildlife in their neighborhoods. And so here are local families who hosted one of these microphones in their yards for about a year each. And we got 12 species of bats. These little cute cotton balls with wings are all different species we found here in LA County, thanks to these um, community scientist families, including the yellow bat, which is a species that only roosts in palms. So the famous palms of LA are important to this particular bat, which is a species of special concern here in the state of California. Also the hoary bat, very similar to the red bat, very similar to the yellow bat, only roosts in foliage, but we're finding it's one of the most common bats in LA. We're very surprised by that. We wouldn't know that though, if we didn't put these bat detectors out there with the help of community members. Big brown bats are kind of telling the opposite story. We thought they would be one of the most abundant species because they're known as urban adapted bats in the United States, but we're finding them very rarely and infrequently throughout LA County. And all those X's are places we haven't found them. And in comparison to the Mexican free tail bat, um, that species has been detected at every single site over 80 plus locations. Um, and this, this graph shows you like, um, we're also putting bat detectors at parks and comparing them what we're getting at nearby backyards, just blocks away. And we're finding that these bats are not only everywhere, but in these parks, they're extra active. Um, there's a lot of activity there. They see these little parks, especially ones with, with uh, reservoirs or like lakes and things like that. Um, they're really enjoying um, being there because of the habitat it provides because the water provides drinking water, of course, but also is breeding grounds for the insects that they eat. So uh, really interesting to see how that a, 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 a park gets 10 times the activity compared to the bad activity in a backyard, just, just not too far away and blocks away in some cases. Um, and we're now expanding this work into including the community and helping us figure out this physical places that these bats rely on to be able to hide during the day and survive during the day while we're out and about um, and a nuisance to them. And so we were monitoring bridges, underpasses along the LA River and county, asking the community to come out with us twice during the summer and, and uh, counting bats for us um, and helping us kind of learn about bat activity and, and bat roost requirements um, across the country. Um, but this has never really been done in this way in Los Angeles, which is really cool. Also allows us to kind of track um, disease, uh, their vulnerability to diseases that affect hibernating bats. We don't even know if our bats here in LA are hibernating or if they're just doing it at higher elevations, if at all, because of LA's really unique warm Mediterranean climate. We need to learn all that stuff before we can really protect them in the way we should be. We're partnering with Libraries, I really wanted to say that before I finished up here is that libraries are one of those site hosts. Boys and girls clubs are also putting their, our bat detectors on the roofs so that we can, can reach out to those communities and they can connect with nature in a very personal way. And also the library communities. As these libraries open up more and residents start using them more as community spaces, then these libraries are also gonna be serving as those those uh, really special places that make that personal connection for people between them and nature. Also working with schools, um, connecting students and their families to local nature by, again, detecting bats, not just in their neighborhood, but in their school that they visit every single day or that their mom or their, their family members would go to. So making that personal connection. And so um, to really blow your mind, here's a, a good example of how resilient some of these species are. So here is a parking sign in Encino, um, just a towway sign. And there's, that's a roost, believe it or not. There's a bat behind there. And here's a video to prove it. Hopefully it'll play. Oh, I'll hit play. So there we go. See, so you can see the shadow. It's gonna go and squeeze itself in there. Very adorable. There it goes, using its little nails to fit its way in there. Um, 
I thought y'all would really like to see that. So I wanted to include that video there. So you're gonna look at these tollway signs a lot differently now, I bet, um, when you when you go and park somewhere. <laughs> and I'll show you this last one. Um, sometimes they miss their mark. I think it's gonna make it, um, nope, not that pass. There it goes, there it goes, spinning itself in there. Very cool, right? Um, but I wanna leave you with this before I get into questions like, hey, um, once this technology gets, gets easier to use, um, as more people are aware that bats are in LA, um, people are gonna be on the lookout for bats. So here I am, this, this one lone weirdo at the football game at USC listening to bats that were eating moths attracted to the stadium lights. But I think in just a few years, there's gonna be a whole stadium full of people listening for bats. And I think that's gonna just come with more awareness, more appreciation for a bat, the role of bats here in LA. Um, and I'm excited for that feature. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer some questions. Oh, Francis, here's a pick, here's a, Massive bat from our collection, from Keith's collection. So that's the big bat I was telling you about. Biggest bat in North America, called LA Home. And then here's some smaller bats there, um, but also called LA Home. Very cool. Anyway, yeah, I'm ready for questions. That does look pretty cool. <laughs> <clears throat> Someone did ask, um, do the Bat boxes, um, do bats actually roost in them? Yeah, in some cases they do. So, um, it takes some patience though, and they're not always successful. Um, they have to be kind of oriented the right way, um, not totally in the sun, or maybe it needs to be more in the sun in some cases, depending on the climate. Um, even that means like painting it a certain color. Uh, and sometimes it takes it almost three years for bats to occupy those structures um but it's worth the shot because the more roosting habitat the better and should there be um certain things that people should be afraid of on bats like you know uh, their droppings or um uh, or any type of disease they carry yeah i mean uh, um casey would be more um up to date of all the diseases that they carry but rabies is one of them you never want i mean the, the majority of bats don't carry rabies and even the ones that show rabies like symptoms even don't, a lot of times don't even have rabies, but um, it's always better to be safe um, than sorry. If you see a bat on the ground, especially during the day, don't go and touch it and pick it up. Um, call, call a museum, that'd be awesome. Uh, or call the local wildlife authorities um, to report it. Uh, take a photo, send us a photo of it um, so we can document its presence. Uh, but don't pick it up. It, it's not worth the risk, um, even though there generally is not, not a huge risk um, with bats being here in LA. Anything you want to add to that, Casey? Or um, No bats well, have, been it. have had the coronavirus, if that's something that you all are concerned about. Uh, it's a different type of bat, and that uh, has has been has been um, detected with that in a different part of the world, and none of those cases have been in North America. Um, are there some signs of um, like a bat roost that we should be aware of, like where they are, like yeah. not to disturb them, kind of thing? Like what what, what should we be aware of on that? Yes. Um, so looking for like first of all, it's the time of day you look. So like look looking at palm trees, looking at huge um uh, if you're in a canyon or something um looking at dusk uh when it's right before sundown just kind of keeping an eye out um to see things moving in the air it's really hard to see because at that time it's getting dark they're really small they fly up high in the air it's hard to pinpoint exactly where they're flying out from even trained professionals it's really hard and we just kind of estimate um, based on on our counts but um but also going places near water um, like the river, the Ellie River, the San Gabriel River, those are types of habitat that they tend to frequent. Or if you live near a park like Echo Park or um, Silver Lake, places with those big reservoirs or Magic Johnson Park, um, those are that's really great habitat for them because they they um, 
frequently use those uh, for feeding and, and drinking water. So <clears throat> it's okay to have opossums by your house, right? Yeah, yeah, why not? They're really cute. Um, and um, there's very low low chances. I mean, I don't think there's any chance. Tisa, you can, again, correct me. Uh, very loaded, little chance of them having rabies, correct? Um, and and also, um, they're the cleanup crew. They're scavengers, um, and and they provide a great service. And even though they're not from California, they're from the East Coast. Um, I mean, they're not they're not um, as invasive um, as other species are that that are introduced to this area. Would you say it's also safe to have bats live like around your house, like the roof or? I would say so. I mean, I'm I'm obviously biased, but I mean, I think the when people have a problem with it is when their guano starts to like to, starts to accumulate and um, start um, damaging roofing material, things like that. But I mean, it takes a lot for that to happen, and so I would I would generally be tolerant of them, to be honest. And they're not they're not living in like the huge colonies like in Texas where there's millions under the Congress Bridge. Um, they're usually in small numbers, and they eat mosquitoes and moths at night, which are pests to us, and we want those around because I find them annoying, and they also pass diseases around uh, mosquitoes. Um, so I personally advocate for having bats, and I, I'd feel lucky if if one lived in my room, um, to be honest. Um. So someone also had asked earlier in regards to coyotes, and um, they wanted to know if there's anything they can do to help a coyote if they look like they're um, not well. Like not well, yeah. Hair. Yeah, there's a California Wildlife uh, a Health Center, um, and that's based in Calabasas. And I know, I mean, sometimes they're at capacity and they can't take in um, new patients. But it's always a good idea to report it to them. Um, I don't have the number on me, but you can Google it, um, and they do their best. And usually, what if if a coyote looks sickly? I mean, sometimes it's 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 uh, sometimes you're confused with like uh, a thin or a young coyote with a sick coyote. But sometimes they really are sick and have diseases called this disease called mange, um, which is passed on by mites and creates desiccation of the skin, hair loss, um, and also ha it makes it hard for them to keep down food and water. Um, so in those cases, they are sick and it's worth reporting those situations um, to uh, rehab centers like like uh, California Wildlife Center. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, but yeah, otherwise, um, yeah, just just uh, I think they're great to have around. Honestly, they're they're really cool as long as you do the right thing and are good neighbors to them and clean up your fallen fruit, leave your keep your cats and dogs inside. Um, I think there's a really great potential for us to coexist. The problems exist when uh, or start to happen when they become habituated to being fed or um, having um, a lot of uh, human food to eat, um, whether that's garbage that you leave unprotected or unsecured, fallen fruit, leaving your cats outside, all those types of things. If you don't have that going on in your neighborhood, it's they're basically ghosts in your neighborhood. You barely notice them. Um, I have them in my neighborhood in Alhambra, and they're really, really amazing. And we can hear them almost every night, but I've probably seen them only three times, um, even though I'm on the lookout for them all the time. But um, anyways, they're amazing animals. and. Um, yeah, we're lucky to have them. And we've had them here since the Ice Age, so they deserve to be here, in my opinion. Well, thank you for all your time and help and, and answering all these questions for us. There's, um, I don't think we have much time left because it is five o'clock. Um, <clears throat> we do need to um, move on. Uh, I mean, I do have one more question I think someone really wanted to know is, is it safe for bats to be around uh, soil where they grow food, like where, like, can they eat the food where the bats are around um, the soil where they grow food? Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, I mean, bats actually are really valuable fertilizer, provide really valuable fertilizer. So if you're, I mean, I think that's the question, right? If you're, if they're growing 
fruits and vegetables in that soil? Yes. Can they eat that fruit and vegetable? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think a lot of places in the country, they value that a lot, um, that type of um, guano, I mean, guano uh, fertilizer. But, uh, but I mean, I wouldn't start collecting it and, and inhaling it. But uh, Casey, do you have any comments on that? No, I, I think you covered it. In general, we kind of want to, if you can contract a disease from a bat, it is most likely going to be with coming into direct contact from them. And the guano can be used as fertilizer, but it is also potential to get different bacteria and stuff like that from the guano. So Miguel's advice to not inhale large quantities of it is a good one. Well, uh, thank you for all this information. And I think everyone had a great time listening to um, both of you speak about um, bats as well as chipmunks and all these wonderful things from the Natural History Museum. Um, I do want you to let everyone know we have an awesome program called Discover and Go. Uh, it had just been started recently again because um, it passes uh, through LA County Library where you can check out uh, to go visit the Natural History Museum as well as the La Brea Tar Pits. I want to share with you so you can see where you can um, go to have access um, to our Discover and Go. Uh, there we go. So you would go to the LA County Library.org slash discover and you can um, visit uh, that web. Uh, our web page to actually check out uh, reservations uh, to have free passes to the Natural History Museum as well as the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, it is a free program as long as you have your library card. So I do advise for everyone to go check out the live, to check out the um, website and see um, what other cool museums are on there uh, so you can um, go out and explore. <clears throat> Now, I don't think we have any other questions um, and thank you for all your time. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we hope that um, we'll be able to have you visit our future uh, virtual programs through LA County. And we do have some um, questions in the uh, survey questions in the email that we'll send out to you. Please uh, do answer them because that will help us in terms of uh, determining what type of programs we should have for you. Um, so thank you everyone.